Do you know that the hardest people to reach with the gospel are the people right here in America? Amen. Because they're rich and comfortable. The hardest people in the world to reach are those that have wealth. Now, I've traveled to a lot of countries. I'm going to tell you something. The greater the need, the greater the openness. Yes. The greater the need, the greater that you see the power of God being demonstrated. The greater the need, the, the, the more you see God give demonstration to His power and His glory. The greater you see the movement of the Spirit. Because the hardest place to preach the gospel is right here in America. Uh, my God. You see? Let, let me just read you from the, the, the uh, introduction to, 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 to the books, Hosea and Amos. Because, see, Hosea and Amos were prophets in times of prosperity and success. Look what he said. He said, instead of responding in gratitude and love to God's grace, extending to them in material blessings, the Israelites used their crops in making offerings to idols. The injustice, bribery, mistreatment of others, all these reflect their laxity of love towards God as well as their fellow citizens. Doesn't that sound like us? Uh -huh. We have taken the blessings of God and instead of res responding to God in gratitude, in thankfulness, and using those things for His kingdom purposes, we have used them to satisfy the lust of our flesh. We have used the blessings of God for idolatry. And in doing so, we have been lax in our love towards God. We have been lax in our relationship to our brothers and sisters. Look what Amos said. The messages of Amos reflect the error of unprecedented economic and political prosperity in the northern kingdom of Israel. Not since the days of Solomon had times been so good. Amos denounces the people severely for neglecting God's word, for social injustice, pleasure seeking, self-indulgence, and gross idolatry. Israel's accountability is greater than that of the surrounding nations because she has had greater privileges and God's judgment is sure to come. My God. My God. See, even in Israel, it's the same problem. Even in Israel, it's the same problem. When things were going good, when God blessed them, when prosperity came, they forsook God yeah. and got into idolatry. Whenever times were good, Israel was gone. And that's exactly what's happened here. See, God, God formed this nation on Christianity. But as God began to bless this nation, as God began to, to, to cover us with protection, God began to bless our ground and, and bless our fruit, the fruits of our ground and, and just brought prosperity to this nation. The more prosperity we have had in this nation, the farther the church gone. That's, right. That's, that's right. right. that's right. And here we are. And here we are. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, look what he said. In Deuteronomy 8, he says, you shall remember, uh, verse 2, and you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to do what? To humble you and to prove you, to know what was in your mind and heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds See, that's why we got to pray for judgment. Because until God humbles us, until we turn back and acknowledge God for who He is, there can be no revival. Look what He said in verse 10. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for all the good land which He has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His precepts, and His statutes, which I command you and that's exactly what we've done. Just like Israel. We've eaten and gotten full, and then we turn away from God. We sit back on our laurels, and we no longer obey His commandments. Look at this. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Look what He says. 
Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Wouldn't you like to have some people come to you, to your church, and say, What must I do to have eternal life? Wouldn't that be great to have people come into the church? What must I do to have eternal life? They came to Jesus. Uh-huh. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. And look what he said. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Look what Jesus said. If you want eternal life, you got to give up everything. Mm -hmm. If you want eternal life, you must forsake everything and come follow me. Now watch this. But when he heard this, He became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Uh And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Did you hear what Jesus said? Mm. How hard it is. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Jesus said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Then why are we preaching a prosperity gospel? Come on, sir. Why are we trying to get people rich if it makes it hard for them to enter the kingdom of God? Come on, sir. Come on. Because the truth is, this is truth. When again, you go to nations of need, people get saved, people get healed, people get delivered, miracles and signs and wonders. The manifestation of God's power is released. But see, when you come to America, when you come to people who are comfortable, people are satisfied, and and people have everything they need. They think they they think they have everything they need. They think they have everything they need. They think they have everything they need. need. And you hardly see anything happen. My God. Jesus tell us straight forward. He, he, he's, not, he's not even pulling, he's not giving even a parable. He's just telling us straight right out, telling us straight forward how hard it is, how extremely hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And, and see, in this nation, you've got to understand that in this nation, I don't care who you are, you're rich Come in on. the eyes of the world. Come on. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. Because 53% of the world's population lives on less than two. The average American makes more than a hundred times what more than half the population of the world has to live on. Even the poorest people in this nation, the people on welfare, the people on on, on all these programs, the the most impoverished places on this earth have more than more than half the people in this world. Yes. When they look at us, when they look at America, they see us as being rich. They don't care who you are. They see you as being rich. Why? Because in the eyes of the world, compared to them, we are rich. Amen. And he said how hard it is for the rich to get into the kingdom of God. Why do you think it's so difficult in this nation? Come on, sir. Come on. Why is it so difficult when you when, when, when God is moving, God is calling us, when, when God is sounding the alarm, why is it so difficult to get people to even hear what he's saying? My God. Amen. Amen. See, when we were in Haiti uh, a few months ago, let me tell you something. We, we were up in these mountains where it was poverty stricken. I mean, I mean, these people had nothing. But you know what? In that little church we were in, that where they had to walk some of the miles to get to that place, in, in, in on, on roads that you can't even drive on because they're so so rocky and steep, and 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 and, and, and if you miss 
distance, you're down a cliff. I mean, and, and there's no place to park anyway. There's no, there is no parking lot like we know it. And most of them don't have cars anyway. But see, when God, when God come, when God called, they packed their place. Four, five, six hundred people every single night packed out their place, standing outside in the dark. My God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to and when God began to move, that place, that was, place was literally shaken from the praise, from the glory of every single individual, man, woman, and child, wholeheartedly worshiping and praising and giving glory to God for what He was doing. My God, my God, Jesus, Jesus, God Almighty. I mean, we would start the services at four thirty in the afternoon so they could get home before it got real dark. And every night, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, nobody wants to go home. Uh, nobody cared about anything like that. All they want was more of God. Uh, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We can't get everybody, anybody in America to come out for anything unless it's going to be something that, 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 that meets their flesh. That, that, that's something like a chicken dinner or some, some cats are going to tickle their spine or, or some prosperity message is going to, you know, show them how to get rich, how to get more money, how to get more stuff. That's going to drive them further away from God. Come on, sir. That's the truth. I mean, I've been in church with people coming and, oh, a pastor, pray with me. You know, I want to get this boat to... <laughs> I'm going to... You want me to agree and pray with you to get a boat? So that you can be out fishing on Sunday instead of being in the house of God and doing what God told you to do. We got to understand, it's hard for the rich to get into the kingdom of God. In Luke 18, verse 28, Peter said, See, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. My God. You see, we, 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 we twist stuff. We, we, we have a way of turning things around. You, you know, we take these, these scriptures out of context. And we talk about how, the, how Jesus and the disciples were so wealthy and so rich and had so much stuff. But when you read what they said, come on, sir. they left it all. They, they, when, when Jesus said, come and follow me, they, they, they put down their nets. They left their families. They left their business. They left their homes. They left everything to follow Jesus. They had no gold and silver when they went into the temple. But what they did have was worth far more in yes. the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. See, we've settled for something that's temporary. We've, we've settled for something that's going to burn instead of getting a hold of the eternal thing yes. that are going to bring forth something that's going to last into eternity. My God. Amen. 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 Uh, See, they received a hundredfold in this life, but it wasn't about money and cars and, and houses. It was about the power. It was about the presence of God. When it, when, when it shadow fell upon people, they were healed in the name of Jesus. See, they got the hundredfold, but it was something more valuable than gold or silver. And let me tell you, the day is coming, the Bible tells us, your gold and silver be cast in the street because you can't do nothing with it. A loaf of bread. You're going to wish you had the real treasures. You're going to wish you had the real thing. The real thing that's going to get you through these last days. When judgment comes upon this earth. When everything is turned upside down. When everything's shaken and men's hearts fail them because of fear. You're going to wish you had something more than gold or silver. My God. My God. Uh, Jesus. Thank you. He said, we left everything and followed Jesus. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Look at this. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but, because, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. He said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. 
And when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has got to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord. Now look at the difference. Okay. That rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he would not let go of what he had. Uh -huh. His heart wasn't committed to Jesus Christ to follow him, to serve him, to please him, to love him with all of his being. His heart was still attached to the things of this world. It was still attached to the idolatry of that stuff that he had. Mm. But look at Zacchaeus. Mm. See, Zacchaeus saw Jesus differently. Zacchaeus saw Jesus for who he really was. And look at this. And, 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 and he says, and he made things come down. But, uh, uh, and he says, Zacchaeus said, uh, uh, Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that was his lost. Ah, hallelujah. You see, when Jesus saw, when, when, when Zacchaeus saw Jesus, he recognized him for this pearl of great price. You see, he's like the man that came across this treasure in the field and went and sold everything he had to purchase that field. He recognized something greater than his money. Amen. See, he gave half it to the poor. And the rest he gave to those who he cheated. Jesus. Because he wanted one thing. He wanted Jesus. Yes. He forsook all to follow Jesus. And Jesus welcomed him into the kingdom. But the rich man wanted to have him both ways. He, he, he wanted to have Jesus, but just enough to save him. See, he, he wanted the, the wealth. He wanted the house and the cars and the clothes and, the, and, and all the stuff, you know. But he, he just wanted enough of Jesus to get him into the kingdom. See, See that's the problem with today's church. We, we, we don't want Jesus. We just want enough of Jesus to get us into the kingdom. We just want enough of Jesus in our, to be a part of our life. Not to be our life. To be a part of our life My to God. get us into the kingdom of God. God. Just enough to keep us out of hell. My Lord. But we want all the other stuff. Ah. Say, look at this. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. See, the rich young ruler went away sorrowful. Zacchaeus went away joyful. This man, he, he, he found this treasure hidden in the field. And for joy, he goes and sells everything he has. He didn't do it. Uh, oh, what did, what did he say? Be a cheerful giver. He didn't do it grudgingly. He, he, he didn't do it sorrowfully. With joy, he went and sold everything he had. Oh, can you imagine what his friends must have thought, what his family must have thought? He come home. See, he, he, buried, he went over to get it. He didn't want somebody else to get it. He, he buried that thing. He was coming back. He was buying that field. He wants somebody to get in there. Hello. He goes home and starts selling everything he has. Can you imagine what it said? What are you? Are you crazy? Have you, have you gone local? Have you gone off the edge? What's happened? What are you doing? But with joy, he sold everything he had. Uh, See, because he found something better. Yes. See, he, 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 he found that hundredfold that was better than the gold and the silver and everything this world has to offer. And he sold everything he had to find something better, to get something more precious, more valuable yes. than anything this earth has to offer. Yeah. He found the pearl of great price and sold everything he had that he might give it. You see, money gives you a false sense of security. The more you have, the safer you feel rather than finding your security in Jesus Christ. The more you have, the less you think that you are needy for God. That's what's wrong with the Church of America. We're not desperate for God. Because the more we have, the less we think we need Jesus. That's right. We don't have to sacrifice our time. We don't have to sacrifice, you know, going to meetings. We don't have to sacrifice going and doing the work of Jesus. We don't have to We don't have to do anything. Why? Because we're okay. Mm. Now look at this. Jesus wrote seven letters to the churches. Five out of seven, he said, "You better go repent, or you're not getting in the kingdom of God." Amen. My God. 
five out of seven, he says, repent. You're not getting the kingdom of God. See, if we, if we would just put all these, these, these parables and these, these stories together and, and see what, what Jesus was saying through these things, that you know, there were ten virgins, only five could get into the kingdom of God. There, there were three with a talent, only two could get into the kingdom of God. Uh, there were seven churches, only two out of seven could get into the kingdom of God. I mean, as you go through these things, you're going to find out that, that and, again, and again, every single one of them, every one he's talking about, they all think they're on the way to heaven. They all think they got it made. They all think that they're right. They all think that, that everything's Okay, but Jesus says, say, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. I, I want you to look at this because the, the, the more you look at this, the more you see what Jesus is saying. And the more you recognize that this is exactly where we are, the more you recognize and, and see that this is today's church that he's talking about, the more you recognize what he is saying about us, about the church of this hour right now, the more you see it. I'm going to tell you something. It, 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 it literally makes you afraid for the people in the body of Christ. Listen carefully to what he says. Listen carefully. Look carefully at what he's telling us. God, give us ears to hear. Jesus, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what Jesus is saying. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, this is Revelation 3.14, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Okay. Jesus is a faithful and true witness. In other words, what he says about something is truth. It's not a conjecture. It's not, you know, what he thinks. It's the truth. When Jesus says something, when Jesus gives his assessment, it is truth. Amen. He is a faithful and true witness. Okay? And you've got to understand where his witness goes. His witness is unto the Father. Amen. When he gives assessment, his witness goes to the Father. This is what I see, Father. Now look at this. I know your works. That's powerful right there. I know your works. I know everything you do. I know everything you do. Wherever you are, whenever it is. I know everything you do in the dark. I know everything you do in the night. I know everything you do in the day. I know everything you do on your job. I know everything you do in your school. I know everything you do, you do in the secret place. I know everything you do. You cannot hide a thing from me. His eye is upon you every place you go, everything you do. He says, I know everything you do. And not does he know it, it's written in the book. My Lord. Now look at this. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Now look what he says. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. He's talking about what we do. You see again, we, we, we gotta get a we gotta get a hold of this because there is so much there is so much false doctrine, there is so much false misconceptions of about the the, the, the the salvation of Jesus Christ. This is what James was talking about. Can faith without works save you? It's not the works that save you, it's the faith that produces the works. But we've got to see this. I know your works, and you are neither hot or cold. Now look at this. I wish, I could wish you were cold or hot. I, I, I wish you were one or the other. I, I wish you either you were either hot or you were cold, because at least then I know where you are. I know where you stand. You know where you stand. He says, you're better off being cold. You're better off not even knowing me. You're better off having no relation, not even professing my name. Why? Because you do more damage being lukewarm than you are being cold. Oh you do more damage by professing to know me when you act like a heathen, when, you, when, you, when your life looks like the devil. Uh, come on. Uh, come on. You do more damage than good. Yes. Jesus. He says, I, I, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm... Because, now look, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to unbelievers here. He is talking to the church in Laodicea. He is talking to us. He is talking to this church, to, to the, the church today. He, he says, so, so, so because you are lukewarm, you are neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jeez. 
Hmm. Now we we we, we got to understand what he's saying. He is not talking about you losing your reward. That you're gonna you, you're gonna miss out on a, on a crown when you when when you get up before the Lord. That, that you, you won't get as many crowns as somebody else. You won't you you, you maybe not get get a, get a bigger mansion. We talk about stuff like that. He said, I'm going to vomit you out of your mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but when I vomit something out, I sure do not want to take it back in. That's right. When I smell that thing, when I, when I taste that thing coming through my mouth, the last thing I want to do is it, it, like a dog returning to his vomit. The last thing I want to do is have that thing come back into my mouth. Mm. When he says, I will vomit you out of, your, out of my mouth because you are lukewarm. You're not cold and you're not hot. He's saying you have no part of it. My Lord. Somewhere in there you left your first love. You left your first words. You left your place. You, you, you somehow departed. You let sin. You let to the carnality to water you down. To come right. To get you in a place where you're no longer on fire for me. I'm spitting you out. I got no use for you. See, at least with cold water, I can. It's, it's refreshing you know, when you're hot. At least with hot water, you can make some tea or, or some coffee, something that, that's refreshing to people. But when you're lukewarm, you, when you're putrid, when... I don't know about you, but I don't like to drink warm water. It's, it's okay. It's, it, it just has that, it's, it's had a taste to it. Like you, you know, you just, you, you do it, but... Oh, that's what Jesus is saying. Now listen. We've got to see this, what he's saying. He's talking about the overall church. He's talking about multitudes of people here. He is talking about, because look, just look around America. It's a little yes, yes. And he is telling us that in this last day, he's going to vomit you out of his mouth. He is going to spit you up. He says, I have no use for you. I have no use for you. You, 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 you can't bring refreshing because you're not cold. You, 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 can't, you, you, you can't get people you, you know, in and, 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 and on fire because you don't have the fire. I have no use for you. What can I do with you? Remember what he says, that the salt loses its, its flavor? It's worth nothing. He says, look, I can't even throw it in the, in the ground and mess up the soil. He says, I can't even throw it into the dung hill. Because it'll mess up the, the fertilizer. He says, at least with the dung hill, I can spread it on the ground and the crops will grow because of the fertilizer the ground. But what can I do with salt, with, with flavorless salt? I can't do nothing but throw it away. I mean, do we even understand what he's saying? He's not talking about rewards. He says, I have absolutely no use for you. What can I do with salt that has no flavor? Mm -hmm. I have no use. Jesus. What can I do with a lukewarm believer? I have no use for you. There's no place in my kingdom. Look what he said. He defines what a lukewarm believer is. He says, because you said. Here's the lukewarm believer. Because you said. This is what you said. This is what the body of Christ says. This is what the church says. Because you said, I am rich. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. How hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom. Because we have no hunger, no thirst, no desperation, no desire, no driving force inside of us. The appetite of the labor works for him because the need of his mouth urges him on. It makes him do something. When you don't have a desperation in your soul for God, when there's no fire burning in your, the depths of your belly, when there is no cry inside of you for more of God, when you are satisfied where you are, when you are satisfied just going through the rituals, going through the motions week after week, and you have no desire, no hunger and thirst to get in the face of God day after day after day after day after day, wanting to pray, wanting to experience Him, wanting to know Him in greater and greater measure. If there's nothing inside of you, burn it inside of you. Jesus. You are lukewarm. Jesus. And he's going to vomit you 
out. What does it mean to be hot? To be on fire for Jesus. That you live and, and, and move and have your being in Him. That you, you live and die for Jesus. That everything I do is about Jesus. It's wanting to know Him, to please Him. You are driven into His presence day by day. You are driven to obey Him and to do what He wants to do. You are driven to have to experience Him, to have to be closer to Him, to, to have to walk in that place with Him. You are driven. You're on high. You're, you're on fire for Jesus. You see why this is so scary? When we look at the, the, the millions, the multitude in the Church of America that are not on fire for Jesus, that are just lukewarm. And Jesus is saying the day is coming when I'm going to take all of you and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Depart from me. I don't know you. Vomit out of his mouth. See, we, we, we just don't we just don't understand what, what this gospel is about. See, that's what the redemption is supposed to produce. Notice what he said. If you go back into other churches, you left your first love. Well, that means you wished out the first love. When you got redeemed, he poured this love into your heart. A love that constrains you to no longer live for yourself, but to live for the one who died for you. The love of Christ that, that propels you, that compels you, that, that, that moves you, that motivates you just to want to live for him and serve him and please him and be in his word and, and be passionate and, and be zealous for him. He gives it to you. He says, you've left that. You've left your first works. You're not doing what I called you to do. You're just doing your own thing. You're going after your own pleasure. You're seeking your own gain. You're, you're just going after yourself. You're not doing what I called you to do. You're not being about my business. You're lukewarm. You see what he's saying? To be hot is to, is to walk in that love for Christ, that bridal love that cannot live, uh, that, cannot, that cannot survive, that just cannot go through, get through the day without having connection with the one you love. Have any of you ever been in love before? Have any of you had that, 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 that first puppy love, you know, where, 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 where your eyes are so blind because all you be, you just consume with this sentiment. Any of you ever been in love? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you're just consumed. I mean, you do the stupidest thing. You, you, all of a sudden, you got no time for your family. You got no time for your parents. You got no time for your friends. Why? Because you are consumed with one thing. Talking to your love. About being with your love. Finding ways. I mean, you do so stupid. So Stupid things. I mean, you you, you promise her the boom. I mean, you tell her anything. Yes. Come on. Come on. Two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. You on the telephone? Yeah. Uh -huh. Get up in the morning. First thing you gotta do. Talking on the telephone. Get 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 them on. When can we get together? When, you know what you do there? All this stuff. Why? Because that first love. That 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 first love that just drives you. That that just pushes everything else into the background. That makes nothing else important anymore. All all you are about is that one you love. Yes. You will do anything for her. Uh -huh. You go any place, you do anything. And I always say, oh, I'll follow you anywhere. Uh -huh. I'll do whatever you want to do. Yes. Till the honeymoon's over. Oh. But that's what he's talking about. He says, that's the love that I gave you. When you were redeemed and I filled you with my spirit, he brought the agape, the unconditional love of Christ and poured it into your heart. He initiated, he imparted into you this love for God, this love for your king, for your God, this love that would drive you, that you would hunger and thirst for his word. It's a new point. That you would hunger for his presence. You would, that, that, that you just want to talk to him. You can't help but pray all day long. Every place you go, you're just thinking about Jesus. Everything, nothing else matters. You're just thinking about Jesus. You're just talking about Jesus. You're, you're just about Jesus. Well, that's called love. Amen. That's that bright love. So when you lose that, you just look we don't have time. We we, we, we we just don't have the energy. We, we we don't have this. We don't have you know. We have all these excuses. 
Like we, 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 we talked about last week, you know, oh, I've got a, I, I, I just bought a field. I got to go take care of it. I just got married. Go take care of my wife. I, 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 I just got some oxen. I got to go back. He's not our first love. You're lukewarm. When you're on fire for Jesus, He is your first love. He is the priority of your life. He is your life. He is everything to you. You're ready to live and die for Him. Yes. You give him anything you want. You promise him anything he has. Ah. You'll suffer for him. You'll be persecuted. You'll be stoned with. I mean, listen. Look at history. They even died again. Mm. And they do that in the flesh. That's the kind of love we're supposed to have. That we will go on that cross with Jesus. We will take up his cross and die with him. Because we love him so much. And we will leave everything. We will leave our nets, our business, our homes, our families, our children, our own lives. We will forsake everything just for Him. Just to have Him and what He represents. Just to have Jesus. And do it with joy. Do it with gladness. Do it, do it, do it with, with, with devotion. Do it with, with hunger and thirst. I found the pearl of great price. I found this treasure. And it's worth selling everything I have. It's worth everything I own. Everything I, I just count it by the job that I may win Christ and be found in Him. I just want Jesus. I give everything up. I just want to know Him. And the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in His suffering, becoming somehow, become like Him in His death, and somehow to attain to that resurrection. Why? Because I am driven. Because I am on fire for God. Because my heart is His. I am hot for Jesus. If I don't find anything else, if I don't get anything else, as long as I've got Jesus. But see, we got to understand, if we don't have that, you're lukewarm. You are lukewarm. All the rituals we go through, all of the, 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 the stuff that we go through week after week and week with, without having any real hunger and thirst for Jesus mm -hmm. is going to be in vain. Come on, preacher. Because when we come knocking on the door, you gotta, gotta look around and say, I don't know you. Come who, on, are you? who are you? Come on, preacher. Who are you? Your lamps weren't full. Mm -hmm. You didn't use the talents I gave you and multiply them for my kingdom purposes. See, that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. We, we, we are to be a cloak. We are to be burning with the Holy Ghost. We are to be zealous and burning with the Holy Ghost serving the Lord. On fire for Jesus. On fire for His kingdom. On fire for His purpose. We have the heart of Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. We have His desires, His thoughts, His purposes, His compassions, His feelings. See, we're just like Him. You see, Because when we see the lost, we're broken hearted over them. When we see the poor, the desolate, the orphan, the widow, the needy, we are broken over what we see. When we see the condition of, 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 of carnal and worldly Christians, we are broken. We are, we, we, we are just broken inside. We are jealous. Because they've turned aside to love somebody else. He's a jealous God. He says he is jealous over his people. Why? Because they're running after idols. They are running after other things. He is not their first love. They are not on fire for Jesus. Mm. He says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Oh, See, if we really got a hold of this, we really got a revelation of this. I'm telling you what, it would glue us to the floor in brokenness. Identifying with the broken heart of God. Identifying with the very tears of God over a people that profess to know Him and don't. Millions in this nation alone. Millions upon millions that claim to know Jesus and have no clue what they're talking about. He says, you say, I'm rich. Become wealthy. I have need of nothing. Isn't that exactly what we say today? 
in all their mega churches and you know we got tens of thousands of people and and and, and, and we see the the pastors on these news shows we we see them how they're just gloating and and, and just oh we're we're just doing so wonderful we 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 have so much money coming in and so many people we're just reaching them by the thousands we're just we're, we're, we're just we're just bringing them in left and right they just come and and we tell them how blessed they are and, and how god's going to help them and bless them all these things you know we Look what Jesus said. And do not know. You are blinded to the truth. Your wealth has blinded you. Your, isn't that what he said? The deceitfulness of riches. Do what? Choke the word. The affairs of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word so it cannot bear fruit. It blinds us to the reality. The devil right there doing what? Blinding you, putting this, this veil over your heart and understanding. Yes. Thinking, yeah, we, we got everything. We're, we're rich, we're set to go, man. We just wait for Jesus to show up. And Jesus says, You don't understand. You you're blind. You can't see properly. You you can't see because you've been you you, you you've allowed this stuff to choke out the truth. He, he, he says, and in reality, here's what I see. You see, you, you think you have need of nothing. Here's what I see. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So I mean, that does not sound like the people of God. You are wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. That does not sound like somebody that's going into the kingdom. Come on. He says, here's what you need to do. I counsel you. I tell you what you have to do. You need to buy from me gold with finding the fire that you may be rich. What's he talking about? You need the divine nature. You, you, you need an attitude adjustment. You need a new nature. You need a nature that is not after your flesh, not after your carnality, not after this world. You need a nature that's after me. You need my nature. You need to be clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to, to partake of His holiness. You need to be a partaker of His divine nature. Why? So that your nature is one that loves God, that pleases God, that serves God, that delights in God, that has joy in doing His will, that just wants to please Him and serve Him and worship Him and praise Him and live for Him. You need Amen. Amen. Get you some gold that's been fire refined in the fire. He, he, he says you, 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 you need some white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. What's he saying? In the condition you are in. Your nakedness, your sinfulness, your, your, your pollution, your, your, your wickedness, your rebellion, your idolatry, your unfaithfulness is all being exposed to the world. You are of your father, the devil. Oh, my God. That's why he says if you're lukewarm, i got to spit you out because you are damaging my kingdom. You are professing my name. You are making people believe that this is what I look like. This is how I act. This is the way I am. Like we said in Psalms 50, he says, how dare you even take my covenant upon your lips when you live in sin? How dare you even take my covenant on your lips when you live in that wickedness? These presidents that get up in there and, and quote the word of God and they're living in sin. God says, how dare you use my holy word out of unclean lips full of adultery and fornication and, and lust and, and, and power grubby. Oh my God, help us. How dare you. He says the same thing to a lukewarm church. How dare you use my word, my holy word, to get more stuff for yourself when you live in sin and carnality and flesh and worldliness? How dare you? He says you need to get some righteousness. You, 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 need to, you need to be made into the very righteousness of Christ. 
that the fruits of your life are fruits of righteousness, that you become a tree of righteousness, the planet of the Lord, that he may be glorified, not malign, not profaned. You profane the name of Jesus every time you do things in his name when you're living lukewarm and in sin. You profane his name. You better get you some robes of righteousness that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Mm. You better get your body, soul, and spirit sanctified by the blood and washed clean and made pure like snow. White like snow. Pure and clean. Mm. And then he said this. And anoint your eyes with eyes salve that you may see. See, a loop, what's he, what's he say? What's he say? You need the Holy Ghost. Can you see what he's saying? He's saying, here we are. Here we are, the professing church. We are the people of God. We are the body of Christ. Look at us. We're, we're rich. We, we're wealthy of need of nothing. And Jesus looks at us and he says, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And, and, and then he says this. You have no divine nature, no righteousness, and no spirit of God. We've been deceived. He says the truth is, the real assessment is, the truth from the faithful and true witness. He who knows, he who sees every one of your work, he looks at us and he says, you do not have my divine nature. You are not holy. You do not have my righteousness. And you don't even have my Holy Ghost. i got to spit you out. Why? Because you are no good to me. I have no purpose. You see, last week when we, when we talk about God created us to be the vessels of His glory, in two ways. In one way, we reveal the glory of God through our transformed lives. Yes. If our life is not changed, how do we glorify God? God, give us eyes to see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. See, Jesus, if, 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 you, if you read another version about the rich young ruler, it says Jesus loved him. He loved him. He turned him away. He rejected him, but he loved him. He told him the truth. He told him what he needed. He loved him. He, he reached out to him. He, he, he gave him opportunity. He showed him the way. Sell all you have. Give the poor. Come follow me. He showed him the way. That was his love. And right here he says, I love you. And that's why I'm telling you the truth. That's why I'm opening your eyes to the reality of your condition. Because if I don't tell you this, you're going to end up in hell. My Lord, Jesus. If I don't tell you where you really are, if I don't tell you the reality of what I see, you will be in hell. I love you. I'm telling you the truth. Because this is what he said. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Why? Because I love you. And without repentance, there's no salvation. Be zealous and repent. Don't stay in that condition. Turn back to God. Be zealous. Get, be willing to let go of everything. Be willing to say, Lord, I forsake it all. Let me back in. Be zealous. Do something about it. Be zealous. Zealous me. Zealous me. Oh, it means you get serious. You get on your face and you cry out until God does something. You don't let go until something happens. Be zealous. And repent. Come back to God. Turn your heart back to God. <laughs> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Where's he knocking? On a lukewarm church. Come on, people, get a picture of what he's doing. He's out here knocking. Who's in the church? If he's out here knocking, who's in the church? Who is in that heart of the lukewarm if he out here knocking? 
Do, do, do you see what he's trying to tell us? How serious this is. How, 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 how drastic this is if we don't do something about it. Behold, I stand at the door and If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, there it is again. If anyone hears. If anyone hears. If anyone hears. He is sounding a trumpet. He is blowing an alarm in Mount Zion. He, he is crying aloud and sparing not. He said, set a trumpet to your lips. He is sounding an alarm. He is blowing the shofar. If anyone has an ear to hear. Because he knows that many won't. He knows that the multitudes will not hear what he's saying. He knows that the multitudes across America filling these churches every Sunday will not hear. And they are destined on the wide road of destruction to end up in hell. My God. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, and opens the door I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You have to hear and respond. You have to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Jesus, I repent. I see the light. I see the truth. I'm going the wrong way. I am cold. I am lukewarm. I, I have left my first love. I don't have a passion. I don't have a zeal. I don't have those things. God, forgive me. And Jesus said, I will come in. I will come in. I will return. Mm. Yeah. You see, most Christians in America, they, they just have a casual relationship with Jesus. They, they're not on fire for the Lord. And the reason is because of the stuff. Because of the affairs of this life and the deceitfulness of the riches. Because of the stuff. We are so surrounded with stuff. We are so full of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, more than half the population in the world is starving. We have houses full of stuff. 26,000 children die today from starvation because we have so much stuff that we have to build garages and barns and storehouses and warehouses to put all the stuff that we never use. And they see no need of Jesus. They, they, they have no desperate need for the Lord. They don't depend upon God. God is just something they've added to their life. Something that they just put alongside everything else they have. Most American Christians are lukewarm. And worse, a lot of them will admit it, but they won't do anything about it. A lot of Christians want to be They just want enough to think they're getting in the kingdom of God. And we got enough pastors that are telling them they will. That are giving them that false sense of security. That are lying to them week after week after week from the pulpits in America telling lukewarm Christians God understands everything's okay. Wow. They feel they have enough of God. They don't. They, 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 they just need more money. They, they need more stuff, but not more of God. They are comfortable with their lukewarmness. And Jesus said He will spit out the lukewarm, the wretched, the pitiful, the poor, the blind, and the naked. That is not a follower of Jesus. People who do not see Jesus as worthy of giving up their stuff, they make God gag. In Hosea chapter 5, in verse 15, he says, here's what I'm going to do. I will return on high until, now look at this, where was Jesus knocking from? Outside. I will return on high until they acknowledge their offense and feel their guilt and seek my face. He says, look, I'm, go I'm leaving you. I am abandoning you. I am taking my spirit. I'm taking my gifts. I'm taking my everything. I am leaving you to yourself in your lukewarmness, in your sin and carnality. I am leaving that place. I'm going to return on high. I am removing my covering, my hedge over you. I'm going back on high until, 
until, until you acknowledge your sin, that you seek my face. Now look what he says. Here's what I'm going to do to, get, to help you out. In their affliction and distress, they will seek me earnestly. What do you say in Isaiah? When his chastening is upon them, they cry out to God. He says, if you will not respond to me for who I am, here's what I'm going to do. I will send distress and affliction upon your life until you repent, until you turn around, until you seek my face again. I will bring stuff into your life. I will bring stuff across your path. I will get you to your knees one way or another. Or you will be destroyed. Chapter 6, verse 1. Look what he says. Come and let us return to the Lord. Let's not be stupid, people. Let's not be foolish anymore. Come on. Can you hear what he's saying? Can you hear the voice of the Lord? Can you hear Jesus knocking on the door of the church? Can you hear him who has left us and went back on high? Can you hear a sound from heaven? Yes. yes. Come on. Get out of Babylon. Get out of this place of idolatry. Get out. Come on. Let's go back to God. Yes. Lord, hallelujah. Let us return to God. Why? Because He has torn you so that He may heal you. He tore you that He may heal you. He has stricken you so that He may bind you up. Look what He says. If we will return to God, if we will humble ourselves, if we will pray and seek His face, if we will turn from our wicked ways, if we will turn back wholeheartedly unto God, He says He will heal us. He will heal our backslides. He will heal our idolatry. He will heal our unfaithfulness. He will heal our sin. And He says after two days, He will revive us. He'll make us alive again. He'll, he'll, he'll give us that life again. He, 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 he will pour that love back into us. He will give us His Spirit back. He will revive us and make us alive again. And then He says this on the third day. He will raise us up that we may live in His sight. Hallelujah. He will raise us up. He'll restore us to that place. Yes, Lord. That he talks about in Luke chapter 1. That we may serve him fearlessly in holiness, in his presence, in his sight, all the days of our life. He will restore us into his grace. He will restore us into that place of his presence, of his power, into the place of his holiness. Yes. Hallelujah. If we will repent, if we will turn back, if we will return to the Lord our God. He'll heal us. He'll revive us. And He will raise us up to live in His sight again. Amen. And then He said this. Yes, let us know Him. Let us be zealous to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared and certain as the dawn. Now look at this. His going forth is prepared. It is certain. See, we don't know the day. Jesus doesn't know the day, but the Father knows the day. And He is telling us here. He says, listen, you better get ready. You better get moving. You better get diligent. You better get zealous. You better return to the Lord. Because the day of His appearing is certain as the dawn. It is already established in the mind of God. There is an appointed time. There is a fullness of time when Jesus is coming upon that cloud. He is coming like a thief in the night. Yes, yes He is. He is. And if you're not ready, you will be left outside. He says, you better get ready. You better get zealous. You better repent. You better return unto the Lord your God in, in wholeheartedly, in brokenness, in, 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 in absolute surrender unto Him. And let Him heal you and revive you and raise you up. Why? Because He's coming for you. Look at this. He will come to us as the latter rain. As the rain. As the latter rain that waters the earth. He will come to us as the rain, as the latter rain that waters the earth. Why? Because we need revival. Amen. Because we need to bring in the harvest. 
He heals us. He revives us. He raises us up to live in the sight. Why? That as we seek Him, He will come as the latter rain. He will so fill us. He will so flood our souls. He will so consume us. He will so take over our being to make us effectual in the fields of harvest to bring in the lost. Amen. To bring in the, the, the fields that are white up to harvest for His kingdom's sake. This is why we have got to get right with God. Amen. We have got to recognize our true condition and get hot for Jesus. Amen. We got to get back on fire. We need the fresh fire. We need the spirit to be reignited in the depths of our being and get us back to burn, to be a glow with the spirit of God fervently, with the spirit of God serving the Lord. Amen. Why? Because the state of earth is in our hands. The state of billions of souls is in our hands. Right. That are going to hell every single day because of a lukewarm church that is going to be vomited out of the mouth of Jesus. I encourage you just to just to go into Revelation chapter three and meditate on that scripture and ask God to give you ears to hear. Ask God to give you revelation about what He's saying.